So, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, the Ten Commandments and their relationship to the two commandments that Jesus gave when he was questioned about what are the most important commandments. Uh, he was confronted by a scribe of the temple who said, well, you know, Master, what what are the, you know, what should I do to gain eternal life? And he said, well, you know, you don't, you know, murder, you don't commit adultery, you don't, you know, do the sins that were listed there. And the scribe said, well, I've done all these things. What else is there? And Jesus said, well, if you want to gain eternal life, you have to do the two great commandments. First is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that discussion got me thinking. And it got me thinking how the Ten Commandments, when viewed as two tables of commandments, loving the Lord your God, loving your neighbor, Right? How they underpin everything else that we do. You know, people, people today think that the Ten Commandments are a thing of the past, right? They think, you know, if you talk to the average person who is, you know, many of whom are sitting in pews around America, right? And you say, well, what do you think of the Ten Commandments? You know, oh, well, you know, we got them at the courthouse and, uh, you know, they're important because, you know, they're, they're the foundation of, you know, all kinds of legal things. Um, and, you know, well, do you still follow? Well, you know, that's, that's the Old Testament. That's, that's not important anymore. Okay? And if you press younger folks sometimes, well, and some older folks, and if you press them about that, they'll say, well, Jesus came, and now the Ten Commandments don't count. That's not what we're about. That, that's not true. <laughs> okay? When Jesus came, folks, he did not come. In fact, he says this. So, you know, you can look this one up, right? I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Okay? The fact that he was able to live his life perfectly and keep all of the commandments did not get rid of them. What it did is it made him the perfect sacrifice for those of us who can keep the Ten Commandments, which is what he ended up being on the cross. So, connecting all of this thinking to what's going on uh, at Asbury right now. To moments of revival. You know, at some point this year, you're probably going to have a revival here. You're probably going to set aside some time, you know, two or three nights, and you're going to invite somebody who doesn't normally preach uh, to come in, and they're going to preach a series of messages in the hopes that they can incite a response from you that will begin a revival. Uh, the Ten Commandments, the two tables of the commandments, the two great commandments that Jesus uttered, are foundational to any revival. You have to understand the law, first of all, to understand that you're sinners. That I am a sinner. Okay? That is the primary purpose of the law. Is to show us our sin. Okay? And in order to understand what's going on in revival, for example, we have to be able to understand our relationship 
to the law and our relationship to Jesus. Okay? What does Jesus say we're supposed to do when we violate the law? Well, he tells us we're supposed to repent. Repent. If you look at the Old Testament, he says, God, God says, you know what? It's not your sacrifice that I'm after. It's not your sacrifice that I'm after. It's a broken and a contrite heart. A heart that you lay before God and say, I, I know I've done wrong, Father. I don't have any excuse. All I can do is come and beg for mercy. Forgive me, Father, for I'm a poor, you know, a poor sinner. Period. So we look today at the first table that uh, the, the the two sets of commandments are called tables. Okay. I mean, imagine Moses walking down. It says. Uh, as he brought the tablets down from the mountain, okay, they were slabs of rock written on both sides by the finger of God. Okay, now keep in mind there are actually two sets of these because on his way down, Moses is going to get so doggone angry that he's going to throw them to the ground. And shattered because he sees the people already breaking God's law. He's been gone a little more than a month while he conversed with God, while God wrote out the Ten Commandments and explained to Moses what he was to do with them. And then he's heading back down the mountain to tell the people this glorious news. And there they are, dancing around a golden calf, right? But today, we're going to consider the first table of commandments. And they're divided into four commandments and six commandments, okay? The first four commandments are designed to tell us how to love God with all our heart, mind, and strength. Okay? And so we're going to take a little bit closer look at that. First of all, God tells us, uh, in reference to the law, that he is a jealous God. When somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Okay? When God says, I am a jealous God, believe him. See, we, we like to think that God's not jealous, that he's not going to act in a jealous way, right? Why did God, you know, one of the favorite things of, of non-Christians is to come at us with, you know, why did God, you know, kill all those people? You know, you know why he killed all the people in the Old Testament? It's because he promised his people they would inherit the land. And that if they put their faith in him, he would give them victory over everybody in the land. That's why all the people that weren't God's people died. Okay? This is who God is. God is a jealous God. God commands obedience. God desires you. He desires you. He loves you. Thank God that Jesus came. That he opened the eyes not only of some of the Jews, but he opened the eyes of the Gentiles from whom I'm descended. Had he not done that, I would have been on the outside looking in under the old law. I want you to picture here, we're going to look at the first commandment, 
love the Lord your God and have no other gods before me. Have no other gods before me. So, first of all, God the Father, this is, by the way, if you want to look in Exodus 20, we're going to be jumping around to a few spots today in your Bibles, but the Ten Commandments are listed in Exodus 20, and we're going to be dealing with the first four today. God seeks our complete surrender. Not half a surrender, not to be shared with a spouse, not to be shared with a job, not to be shared with your children. He wants our complete devotion and surrender. And you say, well, then how am I supposed to deal with all these other people, all these other relationships? If you surrender yourself completely to God the Father, all of the other relationships, all of the other kinds of love are included. Okay? How do we get to the first or, or to the last six commandments on the table? By keeping the first four. Okay? Now, there's a picture of this kind of intense, passionate love in the Bible. In 57 years, I have never heard a sermon preached on this book because it makes us blush. Okay, I want you to turn to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8. Now, I am blessed to have been married to my beautiful wife for 33 and a half years. And for those of you that have been married, I think all of us can think of a time when we've looked at our spouse and we have been overwhelmed with love with desire. And all I want as a husband, all I want as a husband is my wife's complete surrender to me. And all I have to give as a husband is my complete surrender to her. Now I'm talking in worldly terms, right? Because we're not to have any other gods before God. But the love that I have for Anne and that she has for me springs out of the love we share toward God. Chapter 2, verse 8, Song of Solomon. This is, first of all, the Song of Solomon is written, and there's a lot of poetry in it, and it's between two people. It's between uh, King Solomon, we think, is the, is the male and his queen you know and you know we're not going to go off on the fact that he had 700 uh, you know we'll, we'll just we'll just keep that on the down low for now um, but this woman this wife of his that he had this great passion for she speaks first the woman the voice of my beloved Behold, and by the way, I want you to think about the return of Christ when I read this. Think, put yourself in mind of what will that what will that moment be like? The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes. He comes, leaping over mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Now this is King Solomon. This is, this is the man speaking now. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over. And gone. The flowers appear on the earth, 
The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Guys, that's Jesus talking to his church. Okay? The faithful church says the voice of my beloved. And Jesus says to the faithful church, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. That's what absolute surrender looks like. These two people that we just read about could only see one another. That's the relationship that God desires with us. When we look at him, we should be looking at him and seeing nothing else. We should know in our hearts that he is the, the only benefactor we need and we have. He's the only one. He supplies everything we have and our love of him should just pour out because of his love for us. St. Paul said, you know, it's not that we love God first. No, God loved us when we were still sinners. When we were still dead in our sin. We were this filthy, rag-laden pile on the side of the road. And God came along and said, I love you. What I expect is that you will love me too. That's the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. So the second commandment is not to have any graven images. A graven image is a carving, is a is a statue, is a if you think uh, okay, Old Testament scholars here, okay. The, the one thing that we see happening all the time when, when Israel turns away from God, they construct something like a, it's called an Asherah pole. It's like a totem pole. You've all seen totem poles out west, right? Okay? Well, these poles are called Asherah poles, and they would carve in faces of their God that you would go and worship up on tops of hills and mountains. And whenever they turned back to the God of Israel, they would go up and chop down all those Asherah poles. Because they shouldn't have been making these carved images to distract them away from the one true God. That's what's going on in our lives. When we have all of these things, you know, graven images now are politics. What's on TV? Sports. Pornography. Okay? These are all the things that the world provides us to distract us from the one true God. You know, you know I, I am pretty sure I have ADHD. And so I'll be, you know, talking to you and I'll be preaching and then all of a sudden, you know, I see a little glint over in the corner. Who's squirrel? You know, and that's the way we are. That's the way we are. We all have spiritual ADHD. God says, don't make things that distract you from me. Go, you know, when in doubt, go back to commandment number one. Don't have any other gods before me. And above all, don't go around making them. That's the second commandment. What happens when we get distracted? Exodus 32, verse 1. <clears throat> when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Now, keep in mind, <laughs> okay, a little, little side here. Keep in mind, they're looking at Mount Sinai. 
They're looking at Mount Sinai with the glory of God at the top, meeting with Moses. Fire at night, cloud during the day. They can see it. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. He's been gone 40 days, and they've put him out of mind. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, carving tool, and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. What? Okay, now, I'm going to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here. They don't have the Ten Commandments yet. This is what Moses saw as he walked down the mountain that caused him to throw down the tablets. This, right here, they are in direct violation of the Second Commandment. No ifs, ands, or buts. Don't make things. Don't allow things into your life that compete with Jesus. And you say, that's hard, Dwayne. Everywhere I turn are things that compete with Jesus. How do I do that? My answer, it is hard. It is hard. And you, when people look at the life you live, if you try to do this, they're going to think you're weird. They're going to think you're out of touch. They're going to think you're backwards. They will. But we are called to keep God first. We are called to make sure that we don't invite anything into our lives that distracts us from that call. Yeah, it's hard. The people of Israel literally took their eyes off of God, right? I mean, they can look up at the mountain or they can look down at this golden calf. They literally stopped looking at God. When they were distracted by fear, well, gee, we, we don't know where Moses went and we're, you know, what are we going to do now? By a desire for control. Listen, if we make the God, we can tell them. What's, what's the really cool thing about it when you make gods? You can tell them what to do. You're not being told by God. You get to define what God tells you. That's the nice thing. All right? When they're distracted by pride, you know, they're giving up their gold. I can, I can only imagine, you know, uh, you know, people are going to walk by this golden cap and go, you know, I, I gave eight earrings. And that's where they are, right there. You know, and somebody else had a bigger family. Well, I gave 20 earrings. And, and look, it was so shiny. And that's because of all the gold that I gave. All things that if they, if you have an object or a practice or something else that will distract you, you'll have pride in it. That's a sin. It is only Jesus, folks, who stands between us and our distractions, our idols and the eternal punishment that we deserve. I want you to think about that. <clears throat> okay? Jesus Christ is the only one that stands between all the things that we do to be distracted and the eternal damnation we deserve. 
Only Jesus. So, as you confess your sin, as you prepare your heart, right, for revival, the key here is turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. He's stand, he stands between us and God the Father, taking all of our sin upon him so that we can still see the face of God. We can still look up Mount Sinai and see him. Thanks be to God. Exodus 19, verse 5. Here's the other half of what happens when we get distracted. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. He's talking to Moses. And God is talking to Moses. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all of these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Now, this passage was right before he went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. So, he was there for 40 days. All right? The people, right before he left, said, oh yeah, we're on board. We're going to do everything that the Lord tells us we're supposed to do. All right? Before he comes back down, they've already made themselves other gods and have turned away in sin. That's how fickle we are. That's how easily distracted we are. And the only answer to any of that is to turn and call on the name of Jesus Christ. Interesting, because the next commandment is don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Names have power. <coughs> now, I can remember when we had Hannah, and we were you know, going through, you know, the list of names. And we were both uh, pretty convinced we wanted names out of the Bible, right? Um, you know, I voted for Beelzebub, but, you know, that was, that was immediately turned down. Uh, so we ended up with Hannah, and we ended up with Aaron. Okay? And why do we take the time to think about names for our children? Because as parents, we intuitively know the power that goes with a name. The story that goes with a name. My daughter can open the Bible into Samuel and see Hannah and read her prayer. My son can open the Bible to Exodus and find Aaron, the first priest. And know the power that goes with his name. Well, God's name is so powerful, we don't even know it. What you say is Jehovah. No, it's not. No, Jehovah is a, as good a guess as we can put together. Yahweh is a guess. Actually, it's, it's less than a guess. It's more of a deception. Because the people knew that if they said the name of God, they would be struck dead. <coughs> so they, they had to kind of fill in some blanks. You know, well, we'll just use the consonants, we won't use the vowels. And people can kind of make their own thing. Because Yahweh is literally Y-H-W-H is what it looks like written out in the, it's the English transliteration from the Hebrew. There are no vowels. You can't say it. So, you know, we come up with, well, Y-A-H-W-E-H. -H. So that it's something that human beings can, can mouth. The name of God is powerful. And it is to be honored because it represents 
the God of the universe. Revelation 2.17 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers. This, this reminds me about how powerful names are. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. When you meet Jesus and you have overcome this world, he's going to hand you a white stone with a name engraved on it. That name will be unique to you, and only you will know it. That's his name for you. How does it make you feel? God has a special name just for you. And only you are going to, like, like when he whispers to you, when he talks to you, you're the only one with that name. We are to revere God and his name. 1 Timothy 1.17 To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Okay, Paul was big on inserting, you know, the fact that God was to be honored at all times. And we do that by keeping his name holy, by keeping who he is holy. We bless and praise God's name as he reveals himself to us. Daniel 2, starting in verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. The light dwells with God. Keep God's name holy because God is holy. Finally, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day. Well, you all did. Thank you. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay? This is the day we set aside not only not to work, I mean, that's a thing, but also to remember God, to remember all that God has done, to hold him up, to praise him, and to worship him. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. When we keep the Sabbath holy, we are honoring God who gave it to us. Remember, Jesus said, you know, man was not, you know, made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. God knew that we were going to need a rest every seven days. So he led by example. He stopped working after the six days of creation, and now he's coming back to us saying, I want you to rest after six days. Every six days, just take a break. Worship me Worship, use that time to worship me. God takes the Sabbath and the rest it offers very seriously. Exodus 31, 14. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it, we were talking about this in Sunday school, everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. 
Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. God expects us to gather to him on the Sabbath and to offer him worship. In Leviticus, in the 23rd chapter, it says, Six days shall work be done, and on the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. That's what we're doing right now. This is a holy convocation. Okay? It is the Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. Everywhere you go, remember to honor God on the seventh day. Psalm 92 is a song for the Sabbath, and it starts, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. That's what we're doing. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Even in sacrificing a day of labor, Israelites couldn't even make a fire in their houses on the Sabbath. See, but it's cold. It doesn't matter. It involved work, so you couldn't do it. The Lord was giving them something they needed more than work, more than a fire. They needed rest. And he knew it. God reminds us, or Jesus reminds us, that God, in creating a holy Sabbath, was offering a gift to us. And offering, uh, in offering that reminder, he was declaring himself the Son of God, whose authority extended even to the Sabbath. In Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, he says, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In recognizing the Sabbath and that it comes from God, Jesus said, I am the Son of God. I have control over this day. So you say, well, your, your disciples are eating, you know, heads of grain. Yeah, and you know why? Because I said they could. It's my day. I chose to give it to you, but I am the Lord of the Sabbath. To love God completely, sacrificially, and only is what we're called to do. In our love of God, we find all of the other loves, and we'll talk about that next week. God wants us to love Him solely, focused entirely on Him. He is holy and demands our obedience, even in the way we rest. As we seek to love him this way, all of the other loves are revealed to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.